Today we're going to talk about one of the most influential and important, respected and loved newspaper strips in American history. But you might not have ever heard of it. It's George Harriman's Crazy Cat. So Crazy Cat is deeply influential and very important, not just in its historical moment, but as an influencer on many other comics artists. People who have praised and or said that Crazy Cat is a major inspiration include Will Eisner, after whom the comics version of the Oscars is named, Charles Schultz for Peanuts, who we'll talk about more shortly, Dr. Seuss, Art Spiegelman, who wrote Mouse, who we'll be looking at in the future as well, Bill Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes. All of these people would also have major impacts on the comics form, and all of them said that one of their favorite strips and one of their biggest inspirations was Harriman and Crazy Cat. Many scholars recognize Crazy Cat as one of the greatest American comic strips of all time as well, but figure the artists might have a little more pull. Now, the first appearance of Crazy Cat and the Mouse Ignatz actually appears in a different comic strip. Harriman is writing a comic strip called The Dingbat Family, and in the very bottom of that strip, which I've included in your reading, the little mouse picks up a rock and hurls it at a cat. And that's the first appearance of Crazy Cat and Ignatz Mouse. Now, The Dingbat Family was a popular strip in its own right, but a lot of people wrote that they preferred the exploits of the cat and the mouse to the main strip itself. So, on October 28, 1913, Crazy Cat becomes its own strip. It was very popular into the 1920s. It spawned an animated special, including shorts before full films. A counterfeit crazy. Somebody actually made a Crazy Cat comic that wasn't by George Harriman. And even a jazz ballet. Over by the mid-1930s, it was only carried by about 35 newspapers. It still ran, but was less popular with the general public and more popular with, well, intellectuals and artists. It ended shortly after Harriman's death. The last strip was published June 25th, 1944. So the basic premise of Crazy Cat is that there is a cat. The cat's name is Crazy. Crazy is in love with Ignaz Mouse, but Ignaz Mouse is generally quite annoyed by Crazy and shows this annoyance by throwing a brick at Crazy's head. Crazy interprets this brick as a sign of Ignaz's love and attention. And there's a third prong to the story who is Officer Pup. And Officer Pup is in love with Crazy Cat and therefore hates Ignatz Mouse and tries to prevent Ignatz from hitting Crazy with a brick, which makes Crazy sad sometimes. So it all gets quite complicated. Out of this basic formula, Harriman was able to create a variety of storylines and really play metatextually with the form of comics. There are two things that a lot of people point out when they think about Crazy Cat that make it a particularly interesting strip, not just artistically, but also thematically. One of those is the question of race. Now, George Harriman's family comes from Louisiana. They had a Creole background. They were free Creoles of color. And that meant that he had a mixed race heritage. But when he was a young child, his family moved from New Orleans to California and from then on, passed as white. He continued to do this his whole life. And sometimes people would joke about him being Greek or not knowing what he was. No one ever knew that he, in fact, was of mixed race. Despite being well-loved by peers and fans, Harriman was very private, and so probably wouldn't have talked about this issue with folks anyway. But one thing people know is that he did always wear a hat. He didn't like his hair. He didn't like his hair being touched. He even wore hats inside, which was strange for the time. Now, more than just Harriman's own history, we see interesting ways in which the question of race might play out in the strip. A lot of scholars point to the linguistic and identity play of the strip as it celebrates vernacular languages and the musicality often associated with cultural minorities. Crazy has a very particular way of talking, as you've probably noticed, and People have associated this way of talking with uh, what we now call African-American vernacular, with Southern accents, with particularly the Louisiana accent, even with Yiddish. And so this play of his language, this strange, not quote-unquote normal language, points for a lot of people to Crazy's status as an outsider. 
Many strips also actively play with the questions of race and color. It's not an accident that Crazy is a black cat and Ignatz is a white mouse. In fact, in several strips before he wrote Crazy Cat, Harriman would write strips about boxers and particularly featured a black boxer, often drawn as a black cat. This is one of my favorite examples of the way language plays in Crazy Cat, and particularly the way that Harriman thinks about language and cultures as both being able to understand but also not being able to understand each other. If we perhaps think of this strip in terms of Harriman's experience of race and identity, well, it takes on a slightly different aspect. People are talking with each other but might not be knowing or completely understanding the actual language that each other are speaking. The other really fascinating thing about Crazy Cat is the cat's gender. Now, Frank Capra, who was a friend of Harriman's in life, once asked him if Crazy was a girl or a boy, because it turns out, in many of these strips, Harriman will refer to the cat as he, and then a panel later as she. It was unclear. So here was Harriman's answer. I don't know. I fooled around with it once. Began to think the cat as a girl. Even drew up some strips with her being pregnant. It wasn't the cat any longer. Too much concerned with her own problems, like a soap opera. Then I realized Crazy was something like a sprite. An elf. They have no sex. So the cat can't be a he or a she. The cat's a spirit. Pixie. Free to butt into anything. This really does play out around the strips. I'm giving you some examples here of cat being called him, but then the cat is in love with the mouse and Ignatz is always a he. That means that if crazy is a he, then there's a queer reading we can do of their romance. But crazy is also sometimes a she. I really enjoy the strip on the bottom left in which crazy expresses crazy's desire to be the queen of May. And Ignatz says, well, you won't, because we've already chosen our queen. Have you chosen a king yet? replies Crazy. No. Oh, goody, 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 says Crazy, then I'll be the king of May. A lot of people argue that gender fluidity or transgender identities are somehow new to this current generation. We know that's not true for a variety of reasons. I just think it's particularly interesting that we can see those questions of gender switching and sexual fluidity playing out in a comic strip in the 1920s. Oh, and just in case you're too worried, turns out Ignatz really does love Crazy Back. Now, alongside Harriman, I'm having you read some Gilbert Seldes. Gilbert Seldes was a Harvard-educated writer, critic, and editor who worked as the managing editor of a journal called The Dial in 1920. This guy has street cred when it comes to literature. His review of James Joyce's Ulysses is one of the reasons it became well-known in the States even when it was technically still banned for being obscene. And in his work as editor of The Dial, he was responsible for publishing poets like T.S. Eliot. In fact, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland first appears in The Dial while Seldes is its managing editor. So we're not talking about a guy who just likes pop culture but doesn't understand high art. He totally knows high art. But he felt that the separation between highbrow art and lowbrow art was facetious. He was really interested in the way that different kinds of art can create different kinds of messages, and artists respond to them differently. And that's why he writes The Seven Lively Arts. Now, it's a play on an old Greek subdivision of art called The Seven Arts, which refers to architecture, sculpture, painting, music, poetry, dance, and performing. He says that the number need not exactly be seven, but throughout the book, he talks about slapstick moving pictures. He's a big fan of Charlie Chaplin, comic strips, reviews, musical comedy, slang humor, popular songs, and vaudeville. In fact, he has two chapters on comic strips, one on comics in general, and a specific one on Crazy Cat, which is the one I'm having you read. And it was written at the height of Crazy Cat's popularity in 1927. Disclosure time. I'm among Harriman's big fans. I really love it, and I hope you do too.